that this is a massive topic. And I'm not even going to scratch the surface today. When it comes to the issue of forgiveness, there are so many things that we could touch on. And so if you do on, on your own time, if you want to kind of get into this a bit more and to really grapple with some of the biblical truths, uh, I could recommend something like The Peacemaker, which is a wonderful book by Ken Sandy. Uh, but I just want to, I want to recognize up front that this is a massive topic. I think, secondly, that this is also a sensitive topic. Uh, some of you here tonight have been deeply, deeply hurt by individuals in your lives. And so even the, the, the talk of forgiveness and the idea of forgiveness is very, very difficult. I think we need to recognize that it's a sensitive topic, but it's also an important topic. In fact, I would argue it's an essential topic because forgiveness lies at the heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right? The gospel is really, it's just all about the beautiful, the free, the gracious gift, the offer of forgiveness of sins that is ours in Jesus Christ. And I think that's really one of those things that Jesus is driving at when he teaches us to pray this fifth petition. When he talks about the language of forgive us our debts, he's pointing us to the offer of the gospel. And I don't know about you, but I love those words. I love to pray those words. It's such a reminder. It's, it's a comfort. It's an assurance of, of, of the forgiveness of sins that we have received in Jesus Christ. That part of the fifth petition I really, really like. But I think where we struggle is with the second half of the fifth petition. When we start getting into the issue of forgiving others, and maybe that's where you're at tonight. Right? Maybe you find a lot of joy and a lot of comfort from, from the forgiveness that God offers, but you're wrestling, you're wrestling with the idea that you need to forgive someone else. And yet we need to get into this because one of the things that Jesus reveals in the fifth petition is that if you are someone who is a forgiven person, you need to be willing to be a forgiving person. And that's the explanation that you find in the Heidelberg Catechism. And I want to I start there. I'd like us to read that responsibly uh, tonight as it deals with the fifth petition. The question is this, what is the fifth petition? One of the things that you notice as you go through that explanation in the catechism is the reality that the grace that we are willing to show to others is an indicator of how well we understand the grace that God has shown to us. Right? So the grace that we are willing to show to others is an indicator of how well we understand the grace that God has shown to us. And that's just a biblical truth. And it's a truth that we find in Luke chapter 7. One of my favorite stories in Luke, a well overused phrase by this pastor, but one of my favorite stories. I love them all. Um, but this, this story about Jesus, Simon the Pharisee, and the sinful woman. So I'd like to read that together. He wants to read that as well. Um, let's get into this. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. And Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. 
Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did, you did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you, go in peace. This is the word of the Lord. I don't know about you, but as I, as I read that story, my eyes are always drawn to that verse 47, where it says, whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. It's a pretty jarring word. And if we really boil down this passage, there's actually a pretty simple message in it. And the message is this, that whoever thinks very little of their own need for grace is going to be pretty stingy in the grace that they show to others. And if we start to flesh that out and to kind of work that out biblically, what we discover is that the the willingness to be a forgiving person is not optional when it comes to the Christian life. Right? It's a command. I think of Colossians 3, verse 12 and 13. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Right? That's a command. It, 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 it's not an optional activity in the Christian life. And yet it's such an incredibly difficult activity. Probably, you could argue, it's probably the hardest part of the Christian life is that ability to forgive those who have done us wrong. And so the question I thought I'd ask tonight is, Pastor, how do I learn to forgive? And again, this is such an immense topic that there were like several things that I could have touched on, but as I got through the week, I ended up deciding that I'm just going to focus on one thing, and I'm going to try to do that one thing well, because if I don't do it well, then there's going to be no point, I guess, if you work that out. But we're going to focus on one thing. And that is, that is the heart, okay, the, the character that allows us to forgive. Right? So if we want to learn to forgive, I think we need to start by being keenly aware of our own need for God's grace. So I'm not going to deal with like the transaction side of forgiveness or the actual act of forgiving someone. What I want to deal with tonight is the heart. And I want to argue that if you truly desire to become a person who is willing to forgive others, you need to be keenly, so deeply aware of your own need for God's grace. And that's really behind the story of Simon, the Pharisee. And one of the things, if you're familiar uh, with the gospel of, of Jesus, one of the things that you recognize is that Jesus tends to butt heads quite a bit with the Pharisees. If your name is in the Bible and you're described as a Pharisee, it's usually not a great thing. Right? And that's because, generally speaking, the Pharisees were, were, were about kind of external appearances. They, they were about religion, they were about rules, but they so often seemed to miss just the simple point of the gospel. And so often they, they, they lacked grace and they lacked love and they lacked compassion. 
And so at one point, Jesus, in, in Matthew 15, I think, Jesus is quoting from Isaiah, and he says to them, you hypocrites. Right? You honor me with your lips, but he says, your hearts are far from me. So, so they tended to be people, and I, I know we're generalizing here, but they tended to be people who were looking at and judging the hearts of others, but who were not examining their own hearts. And that's a bit of the picture we get here with Simon. So Simon is at his home, he's invited Jesus over, and while they're sitting down to a meal, we encounter the sinful woman. I find that fascinating. The only description that you have of this lady is that she was a sinful woman. Nothing else. And so there must have been something that went on in her life. We have no idea what it was, but she was publicly recognized in that town as being a woman who had led a life of sin. She comes into the home. We know the story. She anoints Jesus with perfume. She's weeping. She's sobbing. She's cleaning his feet. One of the best gospel pictures you can find. A broken woman who is just falling at the feet of Jesus Christ, who is just embracing her Savior. That's her reaction. But then you get Simon. And Simon is horrified. Simon says, if, if this guy, Jesus, if he knew who this woman really was, he would know that she's a sinner. And I think that sometimes when we read this story, we think that the issue with Simon is that he thought he was perfect. You know, the issue with Simon is not that he, he didn't realize he had any flaws. I'm sure Simon recognized that there were issues in his own life. The issue with Simon is that he thought he was better than the woman. Right? He, he was a moral guy. He was a religious guy. He was a guy that that knew the scriptures. He had all these things going for him. And deep down inside, he thought that he deserved God's grace just a little bit more than she did. And so he's busy looking at her life, and he's busy judging her heart. Meanwhile, he has not truly stopped to examine his own. And he's willing, he's willing to kind of make a statement, in his heart at least, about her position before God, but he hasn't truly stopped to actually look at his own position before God. And I think the basic point of that story is that he wasn't able to show grace, he wasn't able to have grace to pour out on her because he hadn't received grace. A couple of years ago when I began ministry here at Blessings, we purchased a home. Some of you have, have been there. We purchased a home in Hamilton. And when we, when we bought the home, the property was really, it was really overgrown. Right? It was one of those yards where there were like shrubs everywhere and vines growing on things and bushes in places and gardens and it was just kind of a disaster. So shortly after we bought the home, we had, we had a friend over who came um, and he had a couple of really useful things. He had a chainsaw, which was helpful. And, and he had a wood chipper which is like the world's most wonderful toy. It's just amazing. You just, you just, you, you, you take branches. I don't know, if you don't know what a wood chipper is, it's like this thing that you pull behind a truck and it's got like grinding things and blades and you just stick stuff in it, just wood chips go out. General concept. Right, you could, you could just take branches, huge branches, and you just stick them in and boom, wood chips come out. It's really fun stuff. But here's the thing, if you want wood chips to come out, you got to put stuff in. Right? If you want output, you need input, and you discover that there's a direct correlation between the amount of output and the amount of input. Right? If you, if you just take like a little twig or something, and you're just like a little branch, and you just stick it in there, it's like... But if you take a big log, like something really fun, and you stick it in, it's like... And a huge amount of wood chips. Input results in output. And I think, I think it's that same idea that applies to grace. You know, when the Holy Spirit takes a hold of your life, what happens is your eyes become open to an entirely different reality 
and you discover that your life is actually a mess. And the Holy Spirit allows you to see things that you hadn't seen before and you realize that your life is actually kind of a disaster and there's, there's, sins, there's, there's sins that are growing all over the place. There's things that are out of control. But the Holy Spirit, what it does is it, he, he doesn't just open up your eyes to the reality of your sin. What he, what he allows you to see is that God, through the blood of Jesus Christ, has purchased you. He's bought you, mess and all. But the Holy Spirit doesn't leave your life a mess. Instead, the Holy Spirit begins to go to work on you. And the Holy Spirit opens your eyes to the reality that you can take those sins, the big sins, the ugly sins, the the sins that no one knows about, and the Holy Spirit opens up your eyes to this wonderful reality that you can take those sins and you just bring them to the cross of Christ. And you just, you just bring them. And, 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 and the more your eyes are open, you just, you, your sins, you just start taking, you're bringing it to the cross of Christ. And it's not a wood chipper, that doesn't work, but let's call it a sin chipper. Right? It's just, you just, you bring your sins and, and, and sin goes in and grace comes out. That's the cross of Christ. You just bring your sin, and the more sin that you bring to Jesus, the more grace he pours out. You just bring it. That's Jesus. You're just, you're just bringing your stuff to him. And he's just pouring grace out on your life in return. But what happens in our lives as Christians is that sometimes we get distracted. We get distracted from the work that we need to do in our own life. And so instead of just being busy over here, we're kind of over by the neighbor's fence. Right? We're just, we're, we're just that, we're that guy, just kind of like, ugh. Oh. Look at his, his backyard's a disaster, right? And we're judging. But the problem with that, the problem with that is this. If you are busy checking out what's going on in someone else's life, and if you're not busy bringing your own sin to Jesus, then you're not going to experience grace. And if you stop experiencing the grace of God in your life, then you're not going to be in that place where you're really ready to show the grace of God to others. And I think that's what Jesus is warning about in Matthew 7 when he says, you know, you hypocrite, take the log out of your own eye, right? do some work on yourself, then you're going to be in a place where you're ready to deal with others. And so I really think that when we are praying this prayer for, for being in a place where we can forgive others, we need to start by praying, forgive us our debt. And I like the language that the catechism uses. I would say, yes, we need to be praying things like, do not impute to us, wretched sinners, any of our transgressions, nor the evil which still clings to us. Let me ask you tonight, are you comfortable if I call you a wretched sinner? No one's making eye contact. Right? We don't, we don't do that. We're like, whoa, wretched sinner, like Heidelberg, ease off. Right? Like, I know I got some flaws, I know my life's not perfect, but wretched, it's a bit heavy. But doesn't that sound a lot like Simon the Pharisee? Isn't that really his reaction to Jesus? He's like, well, yeah. I know I got some flaws in my life, but I'm not that woman. She is wretched. And that's why Jesus tells that little story about the two guys. The one who owes a lot of money and the one who owes a little bit of money. And Jesus says, you know why she loves so much? It's because she just knows her sin. She knows She knows she's a wretched sinner. She's aware. And so she's coming and she's just bringing her sin to Jesus and Jesus has poured his grace out on her life and she is just, she's just flowing with love. But Simon doesn't think that he needs to be forgiven that much. And if you think little of your own sin then you will think little of grace 
and you will have little grace to show to others. If we want to be people who truly have a heart that is willing to forgive others, we, we, we need to truly pray that we would understand what it means to be forgiven. And so we need to pray, forgive us our debts. And I don't mean that just generally. Right? Yes, Jesus says, pray, forgive us our debts, but I don't think he means that we just always pray generally, Lord, forgive our sins. I think the point there is, bring your sins before the Lord. And I would encourage you tonight, I would encourage you to really pursue a prayer life where those things are specific. Where you truly are looking at your own heart, your own life, where you are assessing things and where you are saying, Lord, here is something I need to confess to you. Here's another sin that I need to bring to you. Here's another area in which I realize that I've wronged this person. Here are things that I've thought wrong. Where you truly are willing to bring those things before the Lord. And the more that you do that, the more sin that you bring, the more you bring that before the Lord, He is going to pour his grace out upon you. And he will begin to turn you into a more and more gracious person. You will have a bigger vision of who God is and you will love your Savior that much more deeply. I want to close just with this quote tonight. I think this is a great quote. A deeper intimacy with God sharpens our awareness of sin, which causes a stronger need for grace and a freer offering of mercy. And so I pray that we would really be a people who are getting intimate with God so that we are more and more aware of our own need for grace, more and more aware of our own sin, and then driven to show more and more mercy to others. Let's pray together. Father, we do desire to be forgiving people. And yet it's so hard. Our minds so easily dwell on the wrongs that people have done to us, on the ways in which we have hurt or been hurt, the ways in which we've been scarred by the actions of others. And it's so easy to have a heart that grows cold, and so we pray, Father, that you would more and more teach us to start not by focusing on others, but to start by focusing on ourselves. Really seeing our lives for what they are. And we pray that you, by your Spirit, would just dwell so richly in our hearts that you would convict, truly convict us of sin. Help us not to be general, but truly draw out those specific sins which plague our lives. And as we experience the grace and the mercy that you continue to offer every day, would that, would that open up the reality to us, the transforming reality of becoming gracious people. This is a supernatural work. It is not possible outside of the strength of your spirit. And so we pray that especially for those who are struggling tonight with forgiveness, Father, we pray that your spirit would just captivate and take hold of hearts removing any pride helping us to recognize that if we are forgiven people we must must have a willingness to forgive allow that to happen for your glory in Christ's name we pray